Hello everybody, my name is Matt, I'm with Scope Education here we're going to be talking about wolf parkinson white Syndrome. wolf parkinson white Syndrome is a pre-excitation syndrome, so what exactly does that mean? Pre-excitation just means that there's an early activation of the ventricles using an accessory pathway that bypasses the AV node. So you can see here the SA to AV and the Hisprokinji system right here, and you see the atria right here, and then this little accessory pathway is bypassing all these um, impulses to go straight down to the ventricles. So there's three different types of accessory pathways. You got your anterior grade, which means impulses are able to go from the atria down the accessory pathway to the ventricles. You got your retrograde, which means it goes from the ventricles to the atria. And you got ones that are able to go in both directions. Um, and your, most of your wolf Parkinson white patients are going to be your anterior grade. Um, and that's where you're going to see your delta wave and all that stuff. But you can get your retrograde as well, um, but there's going to be a concealed conduction system in that, so you won't see any delta waves or anything like that. So it's going to be harder, but it's going to, it should be on your radar. And your three different types of pre excitation syndromes are going to be Wolf-Parkinson-White, obviously what we're going to be talking about today, your LGL and your Mahim-type tachycardia. So in basic anatomy and physiology class, you know that all your pacemaker is going to be your SA node, and then the impulse is going to go to AV node, and then down to his Purkinje system here, depolarizing the ventricles. Um, and then, so what's nice about the heart is that it has an insulating fatty layer that separates the atria from the ventricles, so impulses can't go from here to here, or here to here, or anything like that. The only way you can get down is through the AV node right here and that's going to be your little gatekeeper and it's going to be very important for how we actually treat these patients. As I said before this is your uh, Wolf Parkinson White patient. This right here the accessory pathway in Wolf Parkinson White is going to be called is going to be your bundle of Kent and you can see here your SA node to your AV and then your his Purkinje but this impulses also go down here and when you get this myocyte to myocyte conduction when it goes through here until it hits the actual uh, his Purkinje system, you're going to get a widened QRS in this little slurring right here called the delta wave. So here's some statistics on Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. The main one we're going to talk about, is just about, and the most important is going to be the 20% of Wolf Parkinson White patients experience AFib, and obviously it's a congenital issue. It's going to be present at birth. Um, and as I said before, the uh, accessory pathway is going to be called the bundle of Kent. There's two types for your electrophysiologists out there. There's type A, positive delta wave, and a prominent R wave. In V1, that's going to be your left-sided bypass track. In your type B, which is a negative delta wave, in V1, V2, and a dominant S wave in V1, this is going to be your right-sided bypass track. I'm just mentioning these for people who want to do a little bit more research on them. Obviously, it's not that important right now, but for those people who just want to do a little bit more research, uh, they can look at those if they want. Here's some ECG findings. Uh, you got a short PR interval, so I try to find a decent ECG online that show this. It's not going to be perfect like this. I've had a couple of patients with Wool Parkinson White, and you have to kind of scour the 12 lead to kind of find your delta waves. But you got a short PR interval, which is less than 120 milliseconds. So you can see your delta waves here, here. You got your inverted ones right here. Uh, you can see them here, and here, and here, and here, and a little here. Not much here. But like I said, main thing is you're going to look for a wide QRS, a short PR interval, and then a delta wave. Um, and you got to scour your entire 12 lead to make sure you can actually find it. Here's your uh, Wolf Parkinson White Type A. I'll let you take just a quick look at it. You can pause the video if you want just to really examine it. Here's your Type B, and you can pause the video once again. But the main reason we're going to be talking about this is because when you get AFib with Wolf Parkinson White, it spells disaster for your patients, all right? So your ventricular rate can go from 200 beats per minute all the way up to even 300 beats per minute. And like I said before, about 20% of your patients actually have this deadly duo. It can mimic VT or SVT with a baroncy. SVT with a baroncy is just some fancy talk for, uh, you got an SVT with a left or right bundle branch block usually. Uh, and your key findings on a 12 lead to determine if a patient has AFib with wool brockets and white is your alternating QRS size and morphologies. So here it is, uh, ECG Weekly. Love that site. It's uh, it's conducted by Dr. Amal Matu. Uh, if you guys want to head over there and you can subs uh, do a subscription there, it's less than a cup of coffee a day. It's honestly wonderful. Um, Ryan and I both use this extensively, and we love uh, going to this website and learning everything that Dr. Amal Matu puts out. So like I said, huge shout out to these guys. That's where we got this uh, 12 lead. But here is an excellent picture of a wide complex tachycardia. So you can look over here, if you look over and just lead one, 
you can see if you do the box method or something like that, you can see a wide complex hit nearly 300 times, a little less than 300 times per minute. If you look at just lead one, you're going to think it's just monomorphic VTAC. Obviously, it's not. This is Wolf Parkinson White. Um, and if you look down in the long strip of lead two, you can actually see that you got your um, irregularly irregular rhythms. You can see the morphology. So these two are similar, but this one's different, and this one's different, and this one. You can see the, how the QRS morphologies are all different. Now, the way that happens, and obviously here's the same picture you've seen about six times already at this point, but the reason why we keep using it is because it's a pretty decent one. Um, the reason you keep getting different morphologies is because you got your SA to AV node and then his Purkinje system. Normally, you got your accessory pathway, which goes, the impulses go down here and it might link up quickly to the his Purkinje track down here, or it might go myocyte to myocyte to myocyte, which is a slower conduction and attach over here or something like that. Regardless, those are the reasons why you get your different morphologies here. Um, normal AFib does not go this fast. Normal AFib can go at about 150 to 180. But other than that, that's pretty That's pretty much it. When you get rates that are this fast, you always should be thinking some kind of pre-excitation um, is going on here. So what would you actually do if you wanted to treat these patients? Would you give them some lidocaine, some digoxin, some adenosine, some amio? Would you light them up? Or would you give some procanamide? Well, what if I told you that if you gave lidocaine, digoxin, adenosine, or amiodarone, you get something like this? Now that looks absolutely terrible, I'm not sure about you, but I like to be a big proponent of my patients living. So we don't want to go into V-fib. Now the main ones we're going to talk about here are, it's mostly amiodarone, but we're just going to do a little touch of adenosine. Now adenosine's mode of action is basically that it affects uh, the specific potassium channels and it kind of helps drive the potassium out of the cells and inhibits uh, calcium to be pulled into the cells and this usually happens around the AV node so you don't like I said before your AV node is your um, is your gatekeeper right so we go back here AV nodes is very important now just because your ventricular rate is 2 to 300 your atrial rate can actually be up to about four five six hundred beats per minute now what happened to the rest of the couple hundred beats per minute your AV node did a great job at squashing all of them right so your atrial going 600 times a minute even though your atrial rate is 300 about 300 beats are getting squashed by this AV node this is incredibly important for how we do it. So we don't want to give anything that can actually impact the AV node. Your AV node, like it says, your gatekeeper, your accessory pathway is a floodgate. It will be more than happy to accept any kind of impulses, no matter how much, down here to go straight to the ventricles, which will lead you, obviously, into V-fib if, if you get your ventricular rate too high. So we got to protect this AV node. The AV node is something we need to protect. Obviously, adenosine is going to be really bad at this. Don't give adenosine. Now, what about amiodarone? Everyone loves talking about amiodarone, um, and people are like, hey, you know it's a Y complex, it's tachycardic, why don't we give amiodarone? So, um, but before we get on that, we're going to actually talk about a little bit of digoxin. Digoxin is interesting in the fact that it won't kill your patient right away, like lidocaine, adenosine, or amiodarone will do. It will kill them actually in about two to four hours. So, that's why we don't give any of these. Uh, the reason why we don't give amiodarone is specifically because it's technically classified as a class 3 antiarrhythmic drug that primarily focuses on the potassium channels of the heart that are responsible for the repolarization process in the phase 3 of the cardiac action potential. Uh, amiodarone is not normally marked this way, but also affects the, the beta receptors, the calcium channels, and the sodium channels. Uh, due to the fact that it deals with the beta effects of the AV node, it will send this patient right into V-fib. So, what's the only medication you should be giving? It's procanamide. Procanamide will not, uh, does not affect the AV node, and it will only affect the, um, the accessory pathway. So, this will protect your AV node, and it will make your patient very happy when you give it to them. In the end, the f safest and the best way of actually dealing with these patients, because most of the time they will be um, unstable, but if they aren't, like I said, procanamide is a really good option. But in the end, the HA always recommends the safest and most effective way of dealing with tachyrrhythmias is just light them up. Just give them some sedation followed by 200 joules, and that's okay. 
Like I said, this is the safest way of dealing it with it. Synchronized cardio at your patients. Your patients might not be, you know, get, as long as you give them some sedation or something like that, they should be a okay. Hope you guys enjoyed, and you guys have a good day.